Today we're going to take a journey back to look at what used to be custom PC hardware and explore the evolution of storage media. Over the years, the computer industry has embraced and then discarded many types of storage media, moving from lower to higher capacity formats with each new iteration. Today we are going to look at many of these forms of storage media, by first going back to the 1980s, when the home computer boom exploded into life. As an example of the sort of computer that existed back then, this is a new brain computer from Grundy. This modular computer initially relied on cassette tape drives for storage, and had not one, but two tape ports. It was very common for computers in this time period to use domestic cassette tape decks to load and save data, mainly because almost everyone had these tape decks in their home already although tape decks designed for computers did appear later. The amount of data you could fit into a 90 minute cassette tape was between about 100 to 200 kilobytes, and at times loading from these tapes was an adventure in itself. There were of course other tape formats that appeared around this time. Here we can see a NASCOM 1 computer with twin digital tape drives from Philips. These took small dictation style tape cassettes and had the singular advantage with suitable software of holding an index on the tape, like an early file allocation table. This allowed you to seek out a file under program control and load it, erase it or replace it. This was a much faster and more reliable tape storage system and laid the foundation for what was to come later in disk drives. The new brain computer had an expansion port that allowed it to have a CPM module attached and connect to floppy disk drives. The 5 and a quarter inch floppy disk was a circular magnetic disk enclosed in a plastic sleeve and was kept in a paper envelope to prevent dust and fingerprints getting on the exposed magnetic disk. As the name suggests, the disk was flexible and initially stored 360 kilobytes of data, a major step up from cassette tapes in that it could save and load much faster and more reliably. The higher density floppy disks that came later pushed the capacity to 1.2 megabytes. The large 8 inch floppy disks were mostly used in business systems. This brings us to the 3.5 inch floppy disk which were produced in vast numbers and in almost any colour you wanted. Unlike their predecessors, the disc was rigid plastic and the magnetic material was protected by a metal shutter. This greatly improved the robustness of the discs and is a testament to just how long these have been in use for. Capacities started at 720 kilobytes and the higher density disks were 1.44 megabytes. These drives are all but obsolete now, with the drives to read them no longer found in either laptop or desktop computers. However, their life was extended for a while with USB versions of the drive, but even these struggled to operate in the latest operating systems. These discs were also used in early digital cameras, like the Sony Mavica. 3.5 inch discs were easy to obtain and relatively cheap. Although the picture quality was limited by both the CCD chips at the time and the capacity of the drives, this one still operates. While not fast by modern standards in its loading and saving of files to floppy disk, these early digital cameras ran at light speed in comparison to getting traditional camera film developed and printed. We shouldn't forget the PCM CIA cards. These Personal Computer Memory Card International Association cards were used for memory, modems and ethernet. These plugged into your computer and give you these extra bits of functionality. They can have capacities up to 4 megabytes in size. This one as you can see is 512 kilobytes of static RAM. They are very reliable 
and can still be found in some military applications. This brings us to the higher capacity 3.5 inch discs. These are flopticals. These are a combination of magnetic and optical technologies. As you can see from the shutter, these discs can accept up to 21 megabytes of data, which is a major increase on the 1.4 megabytes for a normal 3.5 inch drive. The drives that read these discs could also read the older 3.5 inch drives. So after the 21 megabyte drives, we come on to super discs. These from Emission allow you to store up to 120 megabytes on the disc. These were later upgraded to take capacities up to 240 megabytes. So the amount of storage you could have on one of these discs was considerably increased. This particular storage medium existed around the same time as IDE hard disks, which we'll cover in a moment, and the flopticals and the super disks were ideal for backup purposes. Next we're going to look at hard disk drives. This is a traditional 3.5 inch hard disk drive. There have been a number of different interfaces to these types of drive, the first of which was IDE. Integrated Drive Electronics. This was a parallel advanced technology attachment and attached to the computer via a flat ribbon cable. The SATA drives came later. These became popular for either internal hard disks or for external storage. The SATA scored over the IDE in that the cables were smaller and took up less room. They also allowed faster exchange of data between the disk and your computer. The 2.5 inch drive was considerably smaller and ideal for installation into laptops and notebooks. While not having the upper capacity of the larger 3.5 inch drives, you can still manage to get 5 terabytes on one of these drives at the moment. Although the 5 terabyte ones are considerably thicker. It's also worth talking about SCSI drives. The SCSI drives were another interface to your hard disk. Generally these were not supported on motherboards and you needed a special interface card to actually connect these, having a number of either internal connectors or an external connector for an external disk system. These were very popular and were used extensively before the SATA drives came in. This takes us on to magneto optical drives. These came in a range of capacities from 128 megabytes up to 640 megabytes. They are in a standard 3.5 inch drive format, but they are thicker and need a special drive in order to read them. These were especially useful for backups, taking such a large capacity. Following these, this takes us on to CD disks. The CD disk is synonymous with installing operating systems and applications. The CD disk itself could store around 650 megabytes of data. And following the CD we have the range of DVD drives. There were quite a number of different formats of DVD drives, some rewritable and some you could only write to once. These held as a single layer 4.7 gigabytes of storage, and the dual layer disks could take up to 8.5 gigabytes in storage. The later dual layer double sided disks could take you as high as 17 gigabytes. As I said, these were particularly popular for installing operating systems, which made the installation much simpler and saved you feeding a 3.5 inch drive in multiple times to get the operating system installed. The next format we will look at is the MSATA solid state drives. These came in two physical sizes. This one, the smaller of which is 26.8 millimeters in length, and the larger is 50.8 millimeters in length. These were quite revolutionary when they came out, allowing you to mount these directly on the motherboard and saving the need to put power and data cables to a traditional hard disk. 
they can still be purchased in a range of capacities, up to 4 terabytes, and are used in many embedded systems due to their small footprint. Next, we will look at M.2 SSDs. The M.2 form factor emerged in 2013, a few years after mSATA, with the goal of superseding the mSATA format. They come in a range of lengths and have the advantage that the NVMe ones, Non Volatile Memory Express, boost performance and reduce latency over mSATA. Extending the data rate beyond the 6 gigabits per second limitation of an mSATA SSD. A PCIe based M.2 SSD can support up to 4 lanes of PCIe, with a theoretical transfer rate of up to 20 gigabits per second. M.2 drives typically have higher storage capacities than M SATA drives. One of the problems with curating data over an extended period of time is the obsolescence of storage media. Your important files might be stored on media for which the drives required to access them are no longer manufactured or supported. Although numerous companies used to produce optical drives for computers, the number has greatly decreased because of a sharp drop in demand, as no current PCs are fitted with them. External drives are still available, but the writing is on the wall for the demise of optical drives and media. Next, I would like to look at USB drives. USB drives contain flash memory storage and come in a wide variety of sizes. The USB format has been going for quite a while. I have here a 512 megabyte USB drive I purchased a very long time ago, which is still operational. They come in a wide variety of formats and cases, from the extremely robust SanDisk case to very small USB drives containing 128 gigabytes of data storage. They come in a wide variety of capacities, but you can pick up a one terabyte drive for a reasonable price of around £75 UK. In many cases, the USB drive is now your backup storage medium. And while the USB format is still supported, this will continue to be the backup of choice for many people. Finally, I would like to look at SD cards. SD cards have been around for quite some time. Much of their use is in digital cameras. However, you can plug these into your computer using a small interface on the USB standard. This particular card is 64 gigabytes, and this 128 gigabytes. And you can also have the micro SD card also an 128 gigabytes. Considering where we've come from in the evolution of storage media, it's quite incredible to have 128 gigabytes in a small thing the size of your fingernail. And such cards are now available in one terabyte sizes. So in conclusion, we have covered many, although definitely not all, types of storage media. The trend has certainly been for both higher capacities and access speeds. The age we live in is moving more and more to streaming data of all kinds, from large data centres to data consumers. And as long as this connectivity infrastructure supports this activity, we may reach the point where local media storage is, in itself, an anachronism. Or perhaps the data pendulum will swing the other way, and storage media will become so large and reliable that each of us can have our own disk for life. Only time will tell. But that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching today's video. Please feel free to click on the link in the description below to discover more videos.